Uh, so I really apologize that you're going to see two lawyers right after lunch. Uh, they sh Milton, you got to open the bar before you do that next year. Uh, like Milton said, my name is Morgan Tillman. I'm a lawyer at Foley and Lardner. I flew in from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, to talk to you about a 22-year-old insurance bulletin. Uh, so we're really getting off on a good start. Uh, this thing is old enough to drink. It's old enough to be in graduate school and be a second year medical student at this point. But uh, pick this one out as an example. There are 50 of these, 51 of them if you count DC, uh, in every state. And what they do is they, in the first go around with HMOs, the state insurance regulators uh, got very protective of their turf. And they said, if you take too much risk, you're an insurance company. And that's not something you want to hear unintentionally when you're trying to run a healthcare business. You only want to be an insurance company if you plan on it. It's expensive, it's a pain, you have to talk to me all the time, and, and we want to avoid it. And so what they said it is, this is complicated and terrible. Long story short, if you are a provider and you take risk, downside risk, and you don't take it from the government or an insurance company, the state insurance regulators think you are an insurance company. And that's a really bad situation to be in unintentionally. So I want to talk about what kinds of arrangements, what kinds of products and services have that risk built into them. And then I want to talk about how to mitigate it. And so I think about this, you have four big kinds of of customers, right? You can be direct to consumer, you can sell to, to groups, self-funded benefit plans, and you can sell to the government and insurance companies. You can take any kind of risk you want if you follow the Medicare rules, which you'll hear about, or you are contracting with a Medicare Advantage plan, if you're working with Medicaid managed care, if you're working with commercial insurance, HMOs, PPOs, whether that's individual or group products. They can, you can share any kind of risk you want, you could do full capitation, you could do any of the complex contracting arrangements that hospital systems do. Telemedicine providers could do that. I've worked with people putting that kind of arrangement together. But if you were selling to any other kind of customer, there are some rules about the sorts of risk you can take. Uh, what kind of contracts or what sort of arrangements pose those risks? There's sort of three big ones that, that I hear about and see. Uh, all of them present downside risk. It doesn't matter what kind of form it is. If you're at risk because people call you too many times, people use your service too many times for the amount of money that you've charged them, there, this risk is in your business model. If you're taking capitation, huge risk. If you're giving discounts such that your services are being provided way below cost from day one, same deal, big risk. And unlimited products, there, was, there used to be a lot more of that than there is today, but people said $100 a month will get you unlimited consultations, unlimited contacts. Those, all three of those are arrangements that contain a lot of risk. And it's risk of being identified by a state insurance regulator as an insurance company, not something you thought you were gonna hear about. How do you mitigate that risk? Uh, if you contract with insurance companies, HMOs and the government, You've, you've gone 99% of the way to mitigating that risk. And it's important to distinguish between an insurance company, United Healthcare Insurance Company, and United Healthcare, the TPA, for a self-funded employee benefit plan. They have different freedom to operate, and you have different freedom to operate with them. Alternatively, if you want to sell to the other markets out there in the US, uh, you've got to structure your, your your products and your contracts in a way that mitigates this risk. How do we do that? We've got, to, we've got to limit the amount of services we provide for every dollar we take in. It's pretty simple. And there's a number of ways you can do that. If you limit the access for folks on a direct-to-consumer product, we're going to deliver you A, B, and C, and nothing else at a price that's going to cover our costs for A, B, and C, you're probably OK. You can certainly contract in volume discounts, right? If a customer is going to bring you 10,000 people, they can get a lower price than an individual. 
that makes economic sense. The cost of finding those 10,000 lives was lower. You can absolutely discount by volume. You can, you, you have some freedom to operate there. Uh, you can take upside, right? So in contrast to risk, if you're really successful and you drive costs down overall, you can contract to share savings and you can do that in any of the ways that any provider contracting lawyer can tell you about. Um, if you drive healthcare costs down for a population, if you reduce the cost of a particular kind of service, any, any, any way that you save your counterparty, your customer money, they, you can share in that savings. Uh, and if you think about one sort of hard and fast rule, uh, imagine that every customer uses every, every available consultation you have. Are you gonna be out of business? Are you gonna run out of money? If you are, you probably, probably have too much risk. And you wanna structure differently so that even if you have an overwhelming demand and people access your product or service a lot more than you thought, you are gonna be able to cover your costs and stay in business. Rule of thumb. Uh, so it's actually even faster than I thought. I've got a couple minutes for questions before Milton comes up here with the hook. Uh, Happy to talk. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Are, are you seeing a trend more and more towards hospital direct contracting and taking on that discount? Uh, or are you seeing it going the other way? I think there's a lot of noise uh, in that I'm not sure there is a trend because there is still so much innovation and so many people trying so many different approaches. Uh, if there's one trend I think we are seeing, it's that people are getting smart to the, the subscription model. Um, if you'd asked me three, four, five years ago, uh, where's where did people take on the most risk? It would have been in in offering you know, the, the uh, subscription model on the theory that most people aren't actually gonna call every day, so we're gonna charge 100 bucks a month. That's really gone away uh, in the direct-to-consumer space, or I see a lot less of that, at least. So if there's one, one trend, and it's a good one from my perspective, it's been that people are getting smarter about uh, about not taking on too much risk. And it's obviously, there's an advantage to you from a business perspective of not exposing yourself to, to massive demand for services you can't meet uh, as well. Hello? All right. Um, so there's a lot more private practice physicians now going into like boutique or concierge practice where they do charge, you know, one cover fee or, you know, a monthly fee and they tell the patient that the patient can go in for consultations or be seeing or call or text questions and stuff whenever they want. Is this, are those practitioners at risk for? That's a really great pay? question actually. And, and it depends, let me give you the worst lawyer answer in the world. It depends what state you're in. Everything depends what state you're in, in my business. But uh, there, there has been a movement uh, in states to pass laws that, that we call direct primary care laws. And they are designed to facilitate exactly the kind of arrangements you're talking about. It's concierge style, uh, you know, upfront payment with, with high access for primary care services. And those laws, there's 20 some of them now. Uh, there isn't one in California, I can on it folks here. But uh, they, they allow primary care providers and it's really important if you're looking at these laws to, to be really careful, they're different in every state. But they have explicitly ex sort of said, if you are the right kind of provider delivering certain kinds of services, we're gonna, we're gonna change the law so that you face none of this risk. We're gonna make it very clear you are not an insurance company. Uh, those laws predate sort of direct to consumer telemedicine, the earliest of them, uh, and they've, they tend to be somewhat restrictive around what kinds of providers. In a number of states, it's physicians only, and 
also fairly restrictive in terms of services. So it's generally primary, really traditional primary care. Uh, but the newer direct primary care laws present some opportunity for telehealth providers because they are, they're broader in scope. They're, they're exempting larger swaths of services. Uh, the newest, it's, we're starting to see psychiatry uh, included in these laws. We're starting to see addiction medicine for obvious reasons. Uh, and so I think the challenge in, in a, taking advantage of those laws is that they're different in every state and they don't exist in every state. But for you know, a small practice or if you're in you know, one state and a large practice, there is a lot of opportunity. It's really just gonna depend on where you're at. And there's an active lobbying effort uh, on a national basis to pass those laws. I, am, I don't have any personal position on that. But if you're interested, there, there are advocates out there uh, you can find them online and get involved in your state. Thank you so much. For that. <laughs>